and the harder you train, the less time you can or should train. One of my favorite analogies here is with track and field. Bill, are you not familiar with the fact that sprinters always have larger, more muscular thighs and calves than distance runners? Absolutely. Well, if it was the sheer volume of the work that was responsible for inducing muscular growth beyond normal levels in human beings, then distance runners would have tremendously large thighs and calves, when in fact, in every case, they have stringy muscles. They're, they grossly overtrain. Right. Sprinters, the guys who only run 100 to 400 meters very intensely, have tremendously developed legs. They run very, very hard. This prevents them from running for long distances. The longest sprint in Olympic competition is the 400 meter dash. Why isn't there a mile dash? Because no one can run that intensely that long. Likewise with bodybuilding training. When you, tr when you are training to failure on every set, and you're not resting too long between sets, it's not just that you shouldn't train for long periods, but you literally cannot. No one can. It's in the nature of things. Hmm. Well, that is, this is great stuff. So you, you've determined, and this is some of the stuff you've learned from Arthur Jones, is where it, it, this initial... I learned some of this from Arthur Jones, but I've developed it recently. Hmm. Well, the interesting thing that you brought up Arthur Jones. <clears throat> Arthur Jones advanced this theory 20 years ago, namely that to be productive, exercise has to be intense, brief, and infrequent. Those are the three principles of the theory. He was right. I recognized it immediately. While he was explaining it to me, I reflected on my own experience. I connected those ideas with other knowledge I already had. I saw logically, in reason, why this was true. But Arthur Jones was missing one bit of crucial knowledge. Let me explain. When he first advanced that theory 20 years ago, he suggested that everybody train the full body three days a week with 12 to 15 sets of workout. Now, compared to everything else being espoused at the time, all other training theories, that certainly did seem brief and infrequent. But here was the one bit of crucial knowledge he was missing. There exists a wide range of variation among individuals with regard to exercise tolerance. Don't you know certain people, Bill, who don't tolerate exposure to high-intensity ultraviolet sunlight as well as others? Exactly. Right? Yeah. That's a genetic trait. Follow me here. All genetic traits are expressed across a broad continuum. The most directly perceivable genetic trait is height. With regard to height, you've got midgets at one extreme and the giants of the NBA at the other. That's a wide range of expression of a genetic trait, from midget to giant. With intelligence, you've got morons at the far left end and geniuses at the far right and everything in between. Then again, with individual sunlight tolerance, you've got albinos, Scandinavians at the left end and darker skin types like Negroes at the right who can tolerate long periods of frequent exposure to high intensity sunlight. I have the evidence, but don't you think it stands to reason that that same thing would apply to individual exercise tolerance? Exactly. I have some clients, Bill, who are only doing three sets every seven days. Jeez. Until I got them down to that, they were making no progress. That was the one bit of crucial knowledge that Arthur Jones was missing 20 years ago. Again, he suggested everybody train the full body 12 to 15 sets three days a week, which again, compared to everything else, that certainly did seem brief and infrequent. But there does exist this wide range of variations this broad continuum of expression of that genetic trait, individual exercise tolerance. Some people are morons of recovery ability, as I jokingly refer to one of my s smart ass clients. <laughs> Just jokingly. So, so how would you determine a person's recovery ability? Is All right, very good question. This one particular young man came to me two years ago as a result of having read my books and articles came to understand the theory of high intensity training. He recognized its validity. He came to me therefore wildly enthusiastic, fully expecting to, to achieve the greatest progress of his life. When he came to me, I put him on a standard training protocol of seven 
sets per workout three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. After three months, he was making almost no progress. Now remember, he came to me wildly enthusiastic. After three months of no progress, he became dispirited, disheartened. He was ready to give up. Now, two years ago, I hadn't been training people all that long myself, so this was kind of a new experience. I was a little bit confused, too. I gave it some thought one day and sat him down, and I said, Now, look, let's not regard this thing merely as a physical adventure, but an intellectual one as well. Let's go to the theory that you and I both recognize as the one and only possible valid theory of productive bodybuilding exercise, the theory of high-intensity training. Let's go to the first principle, the principle of intensity. By the way, if, if a, a given bodybuilder's current training program is not yielding him continuous progress, or hasn't been for some time, it's not going to magically start working next week. There's a reason for everything, including lack of progress, and the number of possible explanations is not infinite. You'll find the answer in what I'm about to say. You go to the first principle of the one and only valid theory, the principle of intensity. This young man and I both recognized and agreed that he was not taking the intensity bill. He was carrying each set to failure. Therefore, he was doing everything a human being could possibly do to stimulate an increase in strength and size. We were left to conclude that the increase was not being produced. I'm making a distinction here between growth stimulation and growth production. You don't actually grow during the workout. The workout merely serves as a stimulus. It sets the growth process into motion. The body produces the growth during the rest period. It only stands to reason if the rest period is not sufficient. That is, if you're doing any more sets per workout or any more workouts in a given unit of time that are minimally required to stimulate the optimal increase, to that extent you're overtraining, and to that extent you'll be hampering and possibly be preventing the production of the increase. So that's what we concluded. We concluded that while he was stimulating the increase, his body was not able to produce it because he was overtraining. So to remedy the situation, I cut his workouts back from seven sets to only five. And I reduced the frequency from every other day, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, to every third day. So now he was training Monday, taking Tuesday and Wednesday off, training Thursday, taking Friday and Saturday off, training Sunday. Then, of course, the next week he would not work out Monday. He would take Monday and Tuesday off, train Wednesday, every 72 hours. Hmm. What happened? He remained stagnant. He even regressed a little bit. This really surprised me. Up to that time, I had never encountered such a, a client, one who was unable to make any progress. This is when I started giving some considerable thought to what I knew about genetics how genetic traits are expressed across a broad continuum. If you've got midgets and giants with regard to height, again, a broad continuum of expression, a very broad continuum. If you've got morons and geniuses and intelligence, Scandinavians and Negroes with regard to exercise tolerance, I'm sorry, sunlight tolerance, well, then it only stood to reason that the same thing would apply to individual exercise tolerance. This young man was a midget of recovery ability. So, to further remedy the situation, I cut his workouts back even further in terms of volume from five sets to only three, and the frequency from every third day to every fifth day, and guess what happened, Bill? He started making progress. Now, what do most bodybuilders do? They, they run to their local newsstand, pick up a bunch of magazines, muscle magazines, they run home, mindlessly page through the those magazines, in essence, that, well, that's what it turns out to be, and that's not a put-down. Most young people are not taught how to critically analyze written material, right. which is not necessarily their fault. They mindlessly thumb through muscle magazines, and at random, grab a given training program, then go to the gym and slavishly adhere to it for as long as two years, during which time they make little or no meaningful progress, and conclude erroneously in many cases that they have terrible genetics, that they're hard gainers, 
or no gainers, then they, they lose their fire, their motivation. They no longer aspire to develop to the upper limits of their potential, and their training degenerates into a social ritual. Right. This so, young man started out training seven sets per workout every other day. It wasn't until I got him down to three sets every five days or so that he started making progress. There's a lot more to the science of modern bodybuilding than what I just described as being the typical pattern of most bodybuilders. Most bodybuilders make the mistake, once again, of regarding what's written in muscle magazines as sacred scripture. They accept it uncritically. They have the notion that if something is printed, it has to be true. I know because I had that attitude myself 20 years ago. But I was fortunate to have made the acquaintance of a very intelligent man, Arthur Jones. He told me 20 years ago, Mike Mincer, 95% of what is published on all subjects is hogwash. Now, 20 years later, a whole lot of experience, a lot of studying in the areas of philosophy, logic, and science. I understand that Mr. Jones was being charitable, Bill. In fact, 98% of what is published on all subjects is hogwash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Arthur Jones is a, is a, is a real genius. He is Pardon a, me? Arthur Jones is still one of the, the greatest geniuses ever to contribute to. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Weight training. When you I talk can't to, give him enough credit. Yeah, I, I, think, I think a lot of the younger people or people that are newer to the sport have no idea what his contribution actually uh, amounts to. Um, when you mentioned uh, specifically that the, the client you were working with was doing three sets, right? is that three sets per body part or three sets? Three sets total for everything. What's a, what would it be an example of that, to break it down a little more specifically? He would do a set of squats for his lower body, mm -hmm. a set of pull-downs, close grip underhand pull-downs for his back and biceps, mm -hmm. and a set of heavy incline presses or dips for his chest, shoulders, and triceps. And that was his workout. There's way too much overlapping today. That's one of the reasons for all the overtraining. You've got guys who will do four sets of flat benches for their pecs, four sets of inclines, four sets of declines, all of which work the triceps and shoulders. Then they do four sets of standing presses for their shoulders right afterwards, along with eight other sets of shoulder work. Then they go do four sets of tricep press downs and four sets of dips and something else. With it. They, they end up doing 36 sets per body part. Jesus. <clears throat> Most bodybuilders, and this is a very important subject for those listening, if there's one thing that I could get across to you as being most crucially important during the course of this interview, to you as bodybuilders, it's this. Most bodybuilders are only dimly aware, Bill. They only sense vaguely that overtraining means something kind of, sort of negative. You hear bodybuilders use the term quite frequently. But none of them really know precisely what it means. They've never given it a definition. Therefore, it plays no central role in their thinking or in guiding their training efforts. The term overtraining is very, very important. The phenomenon of overtraining is very important. It's more than something just kind of, sort of negative. It is the worst training mistake you could possibly make. It is that which militates against your achieving the desired result. What is overtraining? It's overtraining, people. It means performing any more exercise than is required, even one set more than is required, to stimulate an optimal increase in strength or size. Even one set more than is required is overtraining. <laughs> wow, that's bad looks, for you. Yeah, this looks like a. Uh, I mean, this is something that uh, even though you've been around, most people still are, are not uh, even aware of. Not getting uh, this. No.